uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your kind invitation. Um, there were so many great talks during this um, webinar that I really feel privileged to have a chance to give a talk to you. So um, as I said, I was going to say a few words about the methods, statistical methods for the analysis of fat data sets or high dimensional data sets which we developed. So we, me, uh, I mean myself, many collaborators from uh, many countries and also uh, many PhD students to student at Wrocław University. So uh, I will, I, I decided to pick like three topics for today's talk. So I will be talking about the sorted L1 penalized estimator, which is one of our developments, adaptive Bayesian version of this method, and hopefully at the end, I will have enough time to take a little, to talk a little bit about bar class. So this is a new algorithm for subspace clustering. So let me just start from the motivation. So, um, so this, uh, for this research, we had data from the Paris Hospital to, pro, uh, from trauma-based group. So basically the, the data contains, uh, the data for 20,000 uh, major trauma patients for which we have 250 measurements. And there are some missing data, as you can see in here. And the goal of this analysis, the objective, is to develop a relatively simple model to help emergency doctors make decisions. So um, immediately after uh, such an accident, patients are taken to the ambulance, and in the ambulance, some measurements can be taken, which uh, can uh, serve as an indication of a patient health. And based on this, immediately in the ambulance, some decisions are made concerning what should be done uh, with the patients when um, he arrives or she arrives in the hospital. So one of the major indicators for this is the number of platelets or amount of platelets. Uh, and uh, this is a measurement which cannot be taken in the hospital. So we would like to predict the number of platelets based on the some measurements which can be taken in the hospital. So we want to build a relatively simple regression model which would allow us to predict uh, our response, number of platelets as a function of, uh, uh, of, of these measurements, which we have to basically identify measurements which should be taken and build a model to predict the number of platelets. So we have a large database, but with a lot of missing data. So the challenge is how to select the relevant measurements uh, having missing data in our file. So we are trying to build really a simple model, like a linear regression model. And theoretically, we want to, so in, 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 in this data set, actually, the number of predictors is smaller than the number of observations. But in principle, we would uh, like to construct a method which could also deal with a situation when the number of predictors is larger than the number of observations. So this is what we define by a fat data set. As you can see here, the fat data set, we have more measurements than the uh, records in such a data set. So uh, clearly, if we want to build such a model, then the model is over-parameterized, it's not identifiable. Uh, there are many solutions, like if you would like to feed least squared regression, there are infinitely many solutions. So uh, basically, what we do in statistics, we use regularization techniques. This is like using a certain prior which uh, um, uh, makes some assumption about uh, how the true solution looks like. And very often we make uh, an assumption that the solution is sparse. So that there are only um, a small, that in this vector beta, the vector of regression coefficients, uh, that there are basically a few important variables, but the number of important variables is substantially smaller than the number of records. So even though in the data set you have many, we will try to reduce the dimension and pick a relatively small number of predictors, uh, which would allow us to predict the response, our Y. So one of the most popular methods for this task is LASSO. This is a method developed by Rob Tipsirani in 1996. So in LASSO, basically, we minimize sum of squares of residuals, like what you do in the uh, regression, least square regression. Plus, we add a regularization um, by uh, L1 norm. So this is L1 penalty. And uh, this is a very nice method. Um, I'm going to say a few words uh, about what might be the problem with this. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we developed an extension of this method, which is called the sorted L1 penalized estimator. So this, is, this was done with, in collaboration with a team of Professor Candace from Stanford University. 
So all the other people were at this time at Stanford. Currently, um, currently Ivan Vandenberg is uh, in um, IBM Computer Center in New York. Kiara Sabati and Emmanuel Candes are still at Stanford. Wei Ji Su is now a, a prof an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. So we basically extended, uh, extended the lasso penalty uh, in such a way that instead of L1 norm, you use a sorted L1 norm. So this works the way that basically when you define this function, you take your beta, you sort uh, the coefficients according to the absolute value, and you penalize them by a lambda sequence, which is, uh, which is non-increasing. Um, non and now, uh, I will tell you later what was the major motivation, but uh, basically, sorted L1 uh, uh, slope, slope extends lasso uh, very substantially, let's put it this way. So in, if all lambdas in our formula are equal to each other, then slope reduces to lasso. Uh, and if here is what you, what you can see in here, what you can see here is the shape of a ball in the L1 norm, lasso, in the lasso uh, norm. And when you use lasso, then the solutions tend to occur on the edges of this ball. And the edges occur when at least one beta is zero. So basically uh, the penalty which you use in lasso uh, induces a sparsity. Specifically when you use lasso, you cannot really select more than n predictors. So usually you select much less than n predictors. But sometimes the, uh, you can reduce the dimension in a different way. So if, uh, in, if you fix uh, such a norm that only first coefficient in our sequence is different from zero, then we use a supremum norm. And here is how the unit ball looks like. And here the edges occur when some regression coefficients are equal to each other. And in some applications, this is the dimensionality reduction which you would like to get. So instead of having many zeros, you basically try to make some coefficients to be equal to each other. So this is what is done by the supremum norm. And this norm basically does not produce any sparsity. So you will have uh, all coefficients different from zero, all p coefficients, but many of them will be equal to each other. So the effective number of different regression coefficients is going to be smaller than n. Now, when you use slope, like the way that the sequence is really decreasing, then uh, we have edges both uh, at the places where uh, Lasso has uh, the edges and at the place when supremum norm has the edges. So slope actually reduces dimension both ways. So it makes many coefficients equal to zero, but also many of them equal to each other. And uh, this additional shrinkage, like clustering coefficients, uh, stabilizes variance. And it's very proficient in prediction, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So the clustering properties of slope, this is a thing which we just started to, uh, to explore. So we have a paper which appeared in Journal of Banking and Finance when we applied this in the context of portfolio optimization. So here, slope substantially, um, substantially extends uh, lasso technique. Okay, and uh, the class of models which is attainable by slope is uh, specified by a very fresh paper by uh, Ulrike Schneider and Patrick Tabdivel. Patrick was uh, working with uh, us at our university, but uh, currently moved to, the, uh, to Dijon, to the Un University of Burgundy in France. Okay, so now, uh, what was the major motivation for us when we developed slope? So we wanted to construct a method which would control the number of uh, the false discovery rate. So what is the false discovery rate? So basically, when we, when we try to identify predictors, some of them will be falsely identified. So some of the predictors which I'm going to assign a non-zero regression coefficient, it's not really associated to the response. So uh, this uh, R number is the number of uh, coefficients which I say should be different from zero. V is the number of what we call false discoveries. So false discovery is the, uh, occurred in the situation when we say that the predictor is important when indeed it is not. So when you want to control for discovery rate, you basically try to control ex expected proportion of false discoveries among all discoveries. So this is a relatively new measure of uh, type one error in statistics. Uh, it uh, was defined this way in 1995 uh, in like a breakthrough paper by uh, Joachim Benjamini and um, Joseph Hochberg. And um, okay, I will tell you, so when do you want to use a DR? When the signal to noise ratio is weak, uh, 
many signals are relatively weak, then I kind of accept that some of my identification will be wrong. So I will have some false discoveries because I want to catch also the signals which are um, close to the noise level. And I want to do it in such a way that this FDI is controlled. And we found out when we developed slope that when I pick the sequence lambda in this way, which is defined in here, psi negative, so psi is the cumulative distribution function of the standard normal distribution. It is a nice increasing function. This function simply is a quantile function for the standard normal distribution. So what we have in here are the quantiles of a standard normal distribution at these levels. So this is a decreasing sequence. If you pick the sequence in this way, and your X matrix is orthogonal, X prime X is identity, then slope indeed controls FDR at the level which we want. So this, this is what we knew. Okay, so uh, what comes with this? So it turns out that this comes with some optimality properties in prediction estimation. There is a series of statistical, uh, theoretical papers which appeared and which explained this. Uh, basically, in, in this respect, slope is better than lasso because lasso can also be optimal under the setups discussed in this paper. But if you would like to have lasso optimal, you would have to adjust the lambda sequence to the unknown sparsity, to the unknown number of non-zero uh, non elements. You can estimate it in some way uh, and you can do it, but uh, slope actually doesn't require this. So slope adapts uh, to the unknown sparsity and is asymptotically optimal for the sequence more or less uh, this one, which I just have shown you in a moment, a moment ago. So there are extensions to classification by logistic regression. Uh, so with are, are theoretical results. Let me just show you how it looks in simulations. Okay, so, so what you have in here is the, is the uh, graph of a mean square error of prediction. Okay, so we calculate the mean square error. We basically find out how well we can predict X times beta, which is the expected value of a response, but it's directly related to the accuracy of prediction. So what we change in our sequence, we change this Q parameter. This Q parameter tells how steep is the slope sequence and we change the constant C. And here we have a situation that NNP is thousand and we have only 20 non-zero predictors, which are relatively weak. And here in this setup, we see this um, white uh, diamond uh, marks the position where the slope is optimal. And the slope is optimal when Q is roughly zero. And Q zero means that the sequence is basically flat, which means that in this setup, actually lasso is the best among all slope solutions. But the situation changes when the sparsity increases. So when we have uh, around 100 uh, of uh, these non-zero non uh, elements, then the best slope solution occurs for some Q which is substantially larger than zero. And when you compare optimal slope solution and optimal lasso solution with respect to prediction, we are doing uh, much better. And also when you have correlated predictors, then slope is actually much better already for very sparse signal. So here is slope to lasso. Here's when we have a dense signal, so K is 100, so there's a huge difference between slope and lasso. And let me just tell you that, uh, okay, so we developed this, we proved FDR control, many other things, but th we are actually not the first ones who are thinking of extending lasso in this direction. So there is a method which is called OSCAR, which was uh, proposed before us, and this method used a linearly decaying sequence. So when we compare this method to slope to our sequence with quantized from a normal distribution, also in this uh, simulation setup, we are doing better than, than, than Oscar. Okay, so we developed the method. We have many applications in many contexts like in genetics, uh, in finance, uh, many also theoretical papers which prove some properties of the method. A very recent thing which we did is, um, so this is a convex optimization method which does not necessarily mean that it's quick and easy to optimize. So we are now quite extensively working on speeding up the algorithm and uh, recently we came up with a screening rule which allows, uh, based on mathematics of slope, which allows to eliminate some predictors even before we run the convex optimization. 
which, some, which substantially reduces the dimension of uh, X matrix and uh, allows us to be efficient. So this is a very fresh thing, just, uh, just accepted to new, new reads. And this is done with my colleagues from Lund. Uh, this is the other place where I work. Uh, Johan Larsson uh, and uh, Jonas Valin. And here are some packages which you created. So slope is uh, basically a package uh, on CRAN in R for generalized linear models. Uh, specifically, it implements this, uh, it, it contains the implementation of its novel strong screening rule. This package is maintained by Johan Larsson from Lund. We have a gene slope package, which is specifically designed for genome-wide association studies. It works the way that we basically identify clusters of um, genes which are close to each other and therefore they are colorated. And then we use a slope on the representatives of these clusters. So uh, I have heard many good opinions, so I'm not a really uh, a genome-wide association person, but people apply this. So this is maintained by Pep Sobczyk. Um, he, he, he is my former PhD student now at OLX group. And we have a group slope package, uh, which is uh, a slope for selection of group of predictors, which is maintained by Alexei Gozman, uh, who did it when he was a PhD student. He is currently working at FDA in the United States. So all these packages were accompanied by papers which were published in Slope, we published an article in Genetics, Group Slope, we published an article in Journal of American Statistical Association. So the thing which I wanted to show you is like one, one specific application which I very much like, which is robust uh, regression. So we are still in the process of publishing this paper. Uh, this is done by my colleagues from Paris. So Alain Virulou uh, defended his PhD about uh, one year ago. And they are uh, these two other people, Agathe Guillot and Stefan Gaifas from Paris, uh, work as supervisors. And this is a very nice model. I don't know if many of you are familiar with this. So uh, we sometimes need to deal with uh, outliers. So we have a situation when we have outline observations. And if you minimize the sum of squares of residuals, this is sens very sensitive to outliers. So there is a, a lot of work done in the direction of so-called M estimation, where instead of the L2 norm, uh, you use some robust functions which uh, basically uh, do not, uh, they a kind of um, make the influence of outliers smaller. And the mean shift model does it in a different way. So in the mean shift model, basically there is a regular regression model when you allow a vector of intercepts, uh, so you allow a, a, a constant here uh, to add a constant for each y, but you assume that this vector is sparse. So you assume that only few of your y's will be different from, um, from this uh, linear model specification. And basically you use the uh, complex optimization techniques or some other techniques to identify uh, which elements of this uh, mu vector are different from zero. In some applications, it is important because uh, robust methods like M estimators usually don't tell you where the outliers are. And this method directly returns the outliers. And in some applications, this is what we are looking for. So we have a biological application where we really were trying to identify where the outliers are. So you basically, what you're doing here, you basically use the L2 norm of a difference and then you use a penalization by slope in our case. And slope is specifically well designed to identify outliers because this matrix here is identity by mu, which is clearly orthogonal. So we had, so we had some theoretical results which show that as long as the number of outliers is not too big, then a confirming estimation of a regression model we are doing um, as well as in case when we had no outliers. And we also have proved that again, under some assumptions, we control the false discovery rate in terms of outliers. Here is some simulations which might be maybe interesting to see. So uh, we compare our methods to other methods for identification of outliers. What you have here on the first graph, uh, so here we are dealing with low dimensional setup low dimensional setup means we don't have too many regressors. Uh, concerning outliers, but it's all, always a high dimensional setup because the potential number of elements in the mu vector is equal to M, to the number of observations, okay? But here we don't have too many elements in the beta vector. 
And what you can see in here is that uh, the blue line is our method. We control FDR exactly at the level which we want it. While the other methods uh, used like soft iPods, so I'm not going to discuss too, too many of them, uh, too much about these methods, they actually do not make any false discoveries. And now we simulated very large outliers. So all the, all the methods have no problem to identify them. And now if you look at the mean square error in regression, you can see that these methods which did not include outliers and have very good power actually uh, outperform our method. So in terms of MSE we are doing here, we are doing slightly worse than the other methods. But the situation changes when the signal to noise ratio is weak. So now we have a weak uh, outliers, we have weak outliers, small signal to noise ratio. We are still controlling FDR. Other methods still do not uh, have actually, they don't include any false discoveries, but have, they have a smaller power. They identify only about 65% of outliers while we identify about 90. And now in terms of the estimation of the regression coefficient, we are now doing substantially better than the other methods particularly here when, when the number of outliers is relatively large. And the similar situation occurs in the high dimensional setup. So uh, here you see that um, we are doing very well up to the point when the number of outliers is like uh, 1500, which is much too much um, concerning real life applications. So we are really in, in, in more towards the left uh, side of the spectrum. And uh, here we are doing better than uh, other competitive methods. Okay, so maybe I skip, the, uh, so we have a nice real data example where we're trying to identify the repetitive DNA sequences uh, related to the um, uh, colorectal, uh, colorectal cancer by identifying both um, sequences with, whose mutation rates were, was larger or smaller than the uh, predicted by the model, which would depend on the number of repeats. Uh, but well, let me maybe skip to the next topic, which probably was going to be the last one. So I will tell you about very recent development, so which is adaptive slope with missing values. Uh, this is a joint project with uh, um, Wei Zhang. Wei Zhang is a fresh, P, uh, a fresh doctor. She defended her PhD like two weeks ago at the Cole Polytechnique in France. Julie Jaws is uh, was her uh, supervisor or advisor. She is a great expert in missing values, in machine learning, a great R expert. So she is very good in uh, basically writing packages in R. Uh, Błażej Mefajedow is my colleague from University of Warsaw. He is a great Bayesian, uh, also very good in machine learning uh, approaches in statistics. Veronika Roczkowa works at the University of Chicago in the Booth School of Business, and she's a great Bayesian, so a great statistician, uh, Bayesian statistician. She developed many methods, and also she is doing now beautiful theoretical work. And we also have a group uh, co-author, which is trauma-based group from hospital. Uh, they provided I, at the data, which I have shown you at the beginning of this talk. So basically we are trying to predict the number of platelets. So we are coming to the problem from which I started. So what is the problem with lasso and slope? So I have shown you successes. So we have successes. Uh, so the successes which we had with a regular slope were like for identifying outliers when the matrix were, was identical, for identifying uh, SNPs in genome-wide association studies, because after uh, selecting representative of clusters, these uh, representatives are roughly not correlated. But when we have uh, larger correlations between axes, both lasso and slope have problems. And the problems are related to the fact that we use the same parameter for shrinkage and collection. And uh, basically, if you want to eliminate uh, false discoveries, you have to use a la large tuning parameter. And this leads to a large bias of important predictors. And what happens then is that this unexplained effect is taken over by not important variables. So it is not only the problem that you have a bias, so we lose uh, a lot of prediction properties, but also actually we generate false discoveries because the unexplained effect is taken over by not important variables. So for Lasso and for the regular slope, identification of a true model is possible only under very restrictive assumptions on the signal sparsity and the correlation between predictors. 
So we have theoretical papers which we published about this. So I think we understand the phenomena uh, well enough now. So how you can solve the problem? Well, you can use adaptive versions of these uh, both methods. So the adaptive versions work the way that you use different lambda for every, uh, 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 for every variable. So you use smaller lambda for predictors which seem to be important. So you can have some prior knowledge uh, from biological prior knowledge, economical prior knowledge, or you can simply use iterations of lasso and slope and iteratively change your lambdas based on the estimates from the previous run. And even if you do it iteratively without using the prior knowledge, you can, theoretically we can show that uh, you eliminate the bias for large uh, regressors, for important regressors, and then you, you don't have this problem of generating for discoveries. So you can uh, actually discover the true model uh, under a much wider uh, range of scenarios than uh, when you use a regular lasso or regular slope. Okay, uh, now concerning like the implementation is very simple. So if you, you basically can use la lasso with different lambda for every coordinate, well, all you need to do is to reweight your X matrix. So you need to divide each column by a respective constant and then you use regular lasso to solve the problem. So this is not any uh, problem concerning like uh, implementation. So uh, the problem is that uh, that is not so clear how to use the weights. So how to, what it means to use smaller lambda. This is a very, very nice paper by actually Veronika Rochkova, which I have shown you, and Ed George. He is a great Bayesian, uh, a great statistician. Um, uh, and they proposed a spike and slab version of Lasso. Uh, maybe let me just show you this. So uh, as I have told you, all regularization methods, in fact, can be thought of as a kind of Bayesian method where the penalty which we introduce corresponds to some prior belief. So in the case of Lasso, the prior which is related to Lasso is the uh, double exponential prior, which looks this way, okay? So we have some peak at zero and we have some, some um, okay, so with double exponential, uh, so this function is not zero, it's quickly decaying towards zero. So now what we are doing right now, like uh, instead of uh, like in regular lasso that we have just one function, we now use two functions. So with a spike and slab approach. So we have two functions, one which is spiked at zero and another one which is much less spiked has a larger variance. So this red one allows for betas to be larger. So if we use a spike and slab distribution and now uh, basically we uh, here you can see the formula. So by different variables, we use weight. Weight is Wi. And this weight is smaller than one in case when we believe that a given variable is a signal and is one in case when we believe that this is a noise. So for variables which we expect are not going to be important, we use some lambda zero. For variables which we expect to be important, we use um, smaller lambda. Clearly, at the beginning, you have no idea which variables are going to be important, which are not going to be important. So what we do, we do a kind of a iterative algorithm where we basically, uh, in this formula for the weight, instead of gamma i, which is an indicator, something important, something not, we simply uh, plug in the probability, posterior probability that this is an important variable, so that it depends, to, that it belongs to the slab distribution which you can calculate using regular uh, base theorem in statistics if you know the value of a parameter. So you have some starting points, some, this is like EM algorithm. So you have some expectation maximization. You have some starting point, then uh, based on this, you calculate probability that something is a signal, something is a noise. You change your weights, you recalculate your coefficients. And after some iterations, it usually converges. So uh, this is Spigen slab lasso. So the solution which they use in Spike and Slab Lasso is that basically they um, fixed some uh, small value for lambda one, so some small, small value for the signal. And uh, for lambda zero, they actually use the whole path of Lasso solutions. So they, they use a large number of different lambda values. So everybody can look at different solutions and pick the one which uh, he or she considers to be uh, the best, uh, maybe use some model selection criteria to identify the best solution. 
So the problem with this, uh, with this uh, approach is that when you use small lambda one, this is like you assume that your signal is large. So if something is different from zero, it should be large. When the, the thing which is a signal is not so large, like what we want to target with slope, then um, it will be classified in the spike. So it will, it, it, will, it will not fit to the small lambda one, then you will have a tendency to classify it in the spike and you will not find the signal. So we changed uh, this uh, spike and slab lasso towards Bayesian slope. So we now use the uh, slope penalty, which is a little bit more complicated. So what is really the difference? So uh, our spike prior uh, is such that it models, so we, we pick our spike prior is fixed. So instead like what uh, they do in spike and slab lasso that they fix uh, slab, we fix spike by making it uh, corresponding to the distribution of signals which are not distinguishable from the noise. We know how the, what is the distribution of the noise, the uh, betas, and we model them by the spike, while the slab we actually base on the data. So in our approach, we estimate many things and uh, maybe I will just show you the results uh, and probably will be uh, slowly converging towards the end. So when the signal is strong, the red line is our method, the blue line is the spike and slab lasso. Uh, so we control FDR, spike and slab lasso actually does not include any force discoveries. We have a slightly larger power. Both methods are almost pe perfect in terms of uh, 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 estimation error. But when the signal is weak, then uh, spike and slab lasso has a small power because it has this problem of uh, not uh, fitting to the lambda, small lambda value. And we are doing much better, we have a larger power. We are also doing better in terms of prediction. Here is our prediction, here is the uh, mean square error of uh, estimation by Spagen slab lasso. Actually here in this setup, cross-validated lasso is the best in terms of prediction. But it has a very large for discovery rate. So 80% of predictors with cross-validated lasso picks are actually false predictors. But it has a power equal to one. So it includes everything which is important and actually has a very good uh, estimation properties. Well, this changes when we have correlation. So when you have correlation, actually, interestingly, our adaptive Bayesian methods work very well. So when the signal is strong, we have no problem with identification of true signals and you have a very small estimation error. And when the signal is weak, uh, we are doing better than cross-validated lasso in terms of estimation even though we have much less predictors. So to slowly converge towards the end, so uh, we also, because this is a Bayesian method, we can also deal with missing values. So missing values in the Bayesian methods, uh, you have to assume some model. So here we are using the model which is missing a random model for missing values. They are treated like uh, extra parameters. You can, in our iterative procedure, you can update them at every step and treat them like extra parameters. Okay, and we have many simulations which show that indeed we are doing so. The method is not guaranteed to control a DR, but it, 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 it under many circumstances it does this and it has very nice prediction properties. And in the context of this data set which we started to talk about, so we are comparing the prediction properties of our method to other methods. So specifically here we have random forests. So random forests are a bit better, but for random forests you have to measure everything and you have a complicated function. So, well, you would have to have a computer, okay, to basically predict your response. While we have a very simple method which includes, I don't think we have written in here, but compared to all the other methods, we have a simpler model. And in this setup, our prediction is comparable to what you get from adaptive lasso. So this is like the standard implementation of adaptive lasso, which you can find in the packages. So what we did, we extended the model and added interactions. So allowed uh, for the products of explanatory variables to influence our Y. So we substantially increased P. And what happened here is that our method did not change properties. So we have the same prediction properties. So adding interactions did not improve prediction properties of our method. We have a st still relatively simple model with six uh, elements in the regression model. 
on here there's so one two three actually four only predictors which are products other methods have more predictors and actually lost prediction properties so we are now better than adaptive lasso which are kind of shows that we address the multiplicity problem so we address the problem of a fat data set by having a data set which is fat we didn't suffer confirming prediction while the other methods actually suffered a bit okay so i think there are still many things which you need to do like speeding the slope algorithm extending methodology there are many directions of extensions and just one last thing that we have a method which we just published for the subspace clustering uh, which probably you you know what it is maybe so uh, when you have a lot so this is unsupervised learning you want to cluster variables and the assumption is that uh, variables are like from low dimensional spaces so instead of like doing pca on the whole data set we cluster variables and do pc uh, and assume that each of these clusters is low dimensional so when you do pca you have a good representation of each cluster so this is like an extension of pca which is more flexible and we just uh, are going we have a package which, which does this and we have an article which is going to appear where we have some theoretical guarantees for the methods and we are now working towards application of this for uh, identification for bidding um, predictive models based on gene expression data and and uh, other applications so i think it's time for me to finish thank you very much for your attention thank you very much uh, okay, for your talk mm -hmm. um, let us open it up for uh, discussion and questions um, let's give it a, a few moments for people to to type in their questions or or ask their question by unmuting Maybe while people are thinking uh, about uh, their, their questions, let me ask a more general question that I have as an outsider. Um, what, um, so you presented the slope method and could you maybe elaborate a little bit more about or on um, in particular which, for which data sets the slope method would be more suited than standard methods and which applications you have in mind for the future for the slope method? Um, okay, so uh, we are, uh, so we have applied it successfully for identifying genes in genome wide association studies. Uh, I expect to, for particularly this adaptive version, I expect it simply to be a very good method to build predictors uh, for any type of the data, particularly when you have correlations. So I don't know what you mean by, uh, by standard methods, like uh, in this setups, which we consider least square regression is simply not working. Okay, because your mm -hmm. P is larger than N. So you cannot use the regular maximum likelihood methods. What people sometimes do, and we, I also worked a lot of this as a stepwise selection. So maybe you know it, so you basically select one, uh, so, maybe just a few things so what people often do like in identifying genes we have a huge huge set of genes not so many observations so what people do they are simply looking for correlations okay so you you want to find the gene which is the best so you basically look for the correlation between your response and your x and you you pick the genes which are most highly correlated and now what happens in in the situation when you say that there's no only one gene which influences your response, but maybe 40 of them, these correlations can be very misleading. So when you have, uh, unless your sample size is huge, you, what you are going to see when you look at the correlation between your Y and your X, you actually, this includes the correlation also between this X and other causal axes. So this order, this ranking of variables, which you get by simply doing correlations is wrong why don't you do um, regular uh, regression so first of all you cannot do it when p is larger than n um, when the but even when your p is smaller than n uh, the variance of least squares estimators depend on the ratio between p and n so when your p is uh, large and let's say we have examples i have a recent paper when you had like uh, n thousand and p hundred 
and the true number of predictors was just five, then this extra variant which you introduce by estimating 95 things which are in fact zero, really disturbs estimation of which things which are important and you lose prediction property. So if you do some model selection strategies, you identify those which are important and you estimate only these things which are important, you have a small variance and you improve prediction properties. And you can see it also when, uh, when P is substantially smaller than N. So there are shrinkage methods like ridge regression. And again, you see like, um, like one thing which, is, which, which I learned when I worked with large data sets. Basically, there is no uniformly the best method. Okay, so depending on what the re reality is, what is the relation between P and N, what is the sparsity behind the data, be behind your signal, what is the correlation structure between your axes, different methods are better than the other ones. So to pick the optimal method, you need to know a little bit of the structure of your data. So I would say that adaptive slope, this is our method which we developed right now, would be good when your P is comparable to N. Uh, comparable means like in gene expression studies, we have uh, N like in thousand and P in uh, tens of thousands. So like factor of 10 is still okay. And when you have correlations, when I think then uh, stepwise selection methods do not work, work as well. And um, LAFO is also not very good in prediction when you have correlated predictors. So there, there, are, there are many methods. So, uh, mm -hmm. okay, so I don't want to go too much into details, but it's such a method which is called elastic net, very popular when you have correlated predictors. And I think uh, slope uh, and adaptive slope uh, are going to improve LASSO in these situations when you have um, correlations between axes. So a specific, specific application which I was thinking about was building really predictive models based on gene expression data. Thank you very much for the clarification. Well, if there aren't further questions, then I, I thank you very much again for your for your nice talk. And uh, thanks very much again. And we'll take a short break then, and we'll continue at uh, 5 p.m. with the next talk. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.